this evening to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. We're going to uh, be finishing 1 Peter chapter 1 tonight. 1 Peter chapter 1. You know, if, if, uh, if, if a friend came to you asking for advice, let's say, let's say it was a, a 20-year-old woman, and she comes and she says, you know, I need your advice. I'm trying to figure out what to do. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm married to my husband. He's a 20-year-old man, and he's good to me. He takes really good care of me. He's kind. He's very wealthy. He meets all of my needs. But I really think that what I need to do is to divorce my husband and marry a 90-year-old death row inmate. What, what advice would you give her? Right. You know, is, is that hard for any of us to know what to tell her to do in that moment? That, that seems like an obvious one, right? Or, you know, you have a friend and he comes and he says, you know, I, you know he's a millionaire and, and he lives in a very happy, comfy mansion. Everything is good there. It's always nice. But he says, I've really been thinking about that box on the corner of the street. It just looks, it's wet and dank and lonely and cold, and I just think that's my new home. But is it hard to know how to advise him to handle that, that situation? You know, it, it's, it's, it's as confusing as the kid who, who, who leaves her unopened Christmas presents on, on Christmas morning because she just can't wait to do her chores, right? You know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't happen that way. And so in First Peter chapter 1, Verses 22 to 25, on, on the surface, Peter is describing a choice that appears to be much more difficult to make. On the surface, Peter appears to be describing a choice that is not quite that obvious. But the way that Peter writes about it, he says, while it may not be easy, it should be that obvious. Uh, as obvious as, as the woman or, or the millionaire should just stay where they are. It should, it should be that obvious when we're making the choice found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. He says, starting in verse 22, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass wither, withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. And Peter is, is writing in here about a choice that the people in Asia Minor, you think back to verse 2, you know, he talks about who he's writing to. He's writing to the churches spread out across Asia Minor, that, that they have an important choice to make. And that we might could understand on, on an emotional level why it was such a difficult choice. But he says, despite the fact that it might feel that way, it is a very obvious choice. And, and the choice is to always put your, your spiritual family first. Let's notice how he talks about that. Notice first in verses 22 and 23, when he's talking about really their origin together, that, that all Christians share the same origin experience. We all have the same uh, birth experience to become a Christian. And he describes how he says they, they purified their souls. And when they obeyed the truth, he says in verse 23 that they have been born again. And he's saying, Anytime you come across a Christian, you have found someone who has chosen Christ just, just as you have chosen Christ. And that, that, that's a, a, automatically a common bond, right? You know, you find someone and they say, oh yeah, I worship over at such and such Church of Christ. You instantly are engaged in that. You know, really? I, oh, and that that's kind of means something to you, you know, because you know that this is another person who has chosen Christ and that there's no, there's no bond that matters more than that bond. Notice back in verse 17. In verse 17, when he's talking about the struggle that these people are facing, and he's talking about how they had called on the Father and that, that he judges each one without partiality, but he says, uh, conduct, your time throughout, conduct throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers. And see, that's the struggle that they were having is, the Jewish Christians were being instructed 
to go back to Jerusalem and fight in this sort of rebellion to overthrow Rome. And, and you know, if you had been told something your whole life, always, that someday God is going to come back and he's going to send a Messiah to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and reign forever and ever, and, and, and suddenly people are saying it's happening now, that that familial tie is going to be strong. It, it's going to be hard to say no to that. But he says, this is the tradition of your fathers. This is your, your blood origin. This is your family by flesh origin. And that is a strong tie. But you have an origin afterwards, a spiritual origin, that should mean more than, than your blood origin, your flesh origin, that, that familial tie. And so they're, they're focused on their blood origin, but he says, focus on those people who share that spiritual origin. I think about John chapter 3 and verse 5. In John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. You know, he comes to him at night, and, and he says, in John chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and, and that's, again, you know, verse 22 of 1 Peter, he's referring back to baptism. Unless one is born of water and of spirit, a, a spiritual birth, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He's, he's talking about how do, you, how do you even get into the kingdom of heaven in the first place. There is a moment where you choose to enter the kingdom of heaven. There is a moment where each of us tonight, if we've done it, have chosen to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's something we all share in common. That means something. And so in verse 6, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It's not that that's irrelevant. It's not that that's unimportant. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. There is a bond, a tie, that is so much greater than any fleshly bond that we might have. And so he says, to to focus on that that spiritual origin. He says in verse 22, it's the moment that, that you obeyed the truth, he says, uh, when he says you have purified, it's a, a word that, that is used in a tense that is, means it happened in the past, but it still has uh, implications today. It's still impacting you today. There was a moment in the past when you chose to obey the truth, to be purified, but that moment is still impacting you today. It still has relevance to you today. It still shapes the way that you see things, the way that you look at things. He says it's, it's through the Spirit, and it reminds me of back in chapter 1 and verse 2, when he says you were sanctified by the Spirit. You chose that moment to, to go into those waters and allow the Spirit to sanctify you, to set you apart, to make you different, to cleanse you. You allow the blood of Christ to be sprinkled on you so that you can have your sins washed away. That's what he's referring to. He kind of hinted at that in chapter 1 and uh, in verse 19 when he talks about how the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, that 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 is what uh, you are cleansed and purified by. And so he says you have, you chose in that moment to, to purify your souls through the blood of Christ, through the sanctification of the Spirit at baptism, which he will talk about more directly in chapter 3 and verse 21. Uh, Peter will reference baptism directly there, but he's kind of hinting at it now to say, don't forget about that moment. That that moment is special. That moment really means something. The moment that I was baptized really means something to me. It, it, we need to keep it on our minds so that it still means something to each one of us, I think is what Peter is saying. And therefore, those who share that are precious to us. He says in verse 23 that, that we were having been born again. You had an original birth. And there's, there's the conduct of your, your aimless fathers, you know. You had an original birth. And that, that's not unimportant. But you have been born again. That's, that's more important. You've been born not of the corruptible seed, but you think of seed, right? Jesus often calls the word of God a seed, right? He says, uh, an incorruptible seed, the word of God which lives and abides forever. The emphasis of that section is the idea, the word of God that is now living and the word of God that is now abiding. It's remaining forever. It is still alive. It is still here and it will always be that way. And so if it is still alive, then that means that our baptism can still be valid. We can still be alive. If it still remains, then we can still remain 
unto eternity, forever and ever. And so if that's true, then this is the most important family tie that any of us can have. And so we have that shared origin. He also talks, though, about a shared purpose. Back in verse 22, when he says that that you did this, you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. And that when it says in, it's really kind of the idea of of unto, uh, for the goal of. You, when you were were baptized, uh, God's goal was that you would grow to have a, a sincere love of the brethren. And so that's the purpose that we have. Now, in chapter, in verse, uh, in verse 18, he talks about the aimless conduct that you received from your fathers. I always thought that was interesting. He's talking about the Jewish people, right? The people who are, have inherited the law of Moses, he says they have an aimless conduct. Their, their, their goal, their purpose, when Jerusalem rule the world. That's their goal. Well, just a few years from now, when Peter wrote this, in AD 70, Jerusalem is wiped clean and destroyed. The temple is completely destroyed. Talk about an aimless conduct, a worthless conduct. There's, there's no good that's going to come from that. They're wasting their time. They're wasting lives. Nobody's going to succeed in that. It's pointless. That could be your purpose, he says, or the purpose of, of having brotherly love and sincere Um, You know, brotherly love is really, it carries the idea of friendship, an affection that you feel to one another. I once heard someone say that you don't have to like the brethren, you have to love them. And I don't think that's true. It sounds nice, right? Sometimes, you know, you don't have to like them. But but Philadelphia is the idea of brotherly love. That word carries the idea of an affection that you feel toward them. He's saying you do like them. Now, it's not always easy, right? We understand that. Uh, I don't always make it easy to like me, and, and we don't always make it easy to like ourselves, but, but, but that's the command. That's the goal, an affection that makes you want to love them, to want to be close to them. And so he says that this is a sincere love. The idea of it's literally a hypocritical is the word, an unhypocritical, a, a, it doesn't conceal any un, uh, false motivations. You're not hiding how you feel. It is that you genuinely want to like each other. You genuinely want to prefer each other over anybody else. And so they have this origin, the spir- their spiritual birth. They have this purpose to, to just genuinely like and care about one another. And that leads to a shared command he gives in verse 22. that you, uh, He says, if you, if you have been purified in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, the command is, love one another fervently. Now, brotherly love is Philadelphia. That's the affection. Love, the command part of that verse, is agape. That's that love that, that, that transcends sacrifice, right? You want to have a relationship so bad that you'll do anything. You'll sacrifice anything to have it. Based on 1 John, when in chapter 4, he describes Jesus' agape, that he loved us so much. He wanted a relationship with us so much that he was willing to, to, to give up anything, including dying on the cross, to let us have it. That's the word he's using here. And so he says uh, that they need to, to desire a relationship so much that they will sacrifice even going back to Jerusalem, back to their families, back to their flesh and blood, back to their old religion, back to that way of life, they'll sacrifice anything to have one another. And it's kind of interesting, when it says love, that is written in a tense that implies that they haven't been doing it. It's not keep loving one another, it's start loving. Maybe they used to, but there's obviously problems. If you read the first few verses of chapter 2 and he talks about malice and backbiting and envy, there's obviously serious problems in the congregations that he's writing to. And he says it's time to start loving one another. He says to love each other fervently. It's the idea of stretching your will in sort of a tense eagerness. Uh, I can't wait. That's the idea. I can't wait to love my brethren. I sit on pins and needles to show you how much I love you. That's what, that's what Peter is writing about. 
I, I can't wait till I have an opportunity to prove it to you by sacrificing whatever I have to to have a relationship with you. That's to fervently, eagerly, with anticipation. I can't wait. It's not, it's not something we feel obligated to do. It's, okay, I, I, I could go to this other thing with my family, but I didn't feel like it was probably the best thing, so I'm here instead, and, and I, guess, I guess that was right. No, it's, I can't wait to be with and to sacrifice for and to do whatever I can to build relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And he says that that's done with a pure heart. Now heart, we've talked about, is sort of the idea of it's the seed of decision making in the Bible. It's heart's not emotion as much as where you make choices, how you reason through things to decide what you're going to do. And pure is literally the idea of, of clean. He says, clean decisions. Clean, coming from the Old Testament, uh, you know, something that's unclean, can't be touched, a picture of sin. And so he's saying, if it's a clean decision, it's a decision untouched by sin. You're not making these choices based on, on sinful impulses or sinful motivations. If you decide to love the brethren, it's not based on, on some sinful desire or, or, or sinful gain that you might get out of it. You know, uh, uh, I did pick the church over my family, but that's mostly just because the church can uh, you know, then, then help support my business and I can get more money, right? You know, that kind of thing. It's, it is a sincere, a pure, untouched by sin. The choices you make about how you spend time and do for the church is untouched by sinful desires, so that you can just truly love them with eagerness, attention. You can't wait to do it. You know, it's the picture he's painting really is you have, you're in a burning house and, and you have to get out. You have seconds, seconds to get out. And, and, and here in front of you is a stack of uh, pictures of your grandmother. They're the only pictures that exist. You don't have digital copies. You don't have anything else. These are stacks of pictures of your grandmother and if you don't grab them when you run out, you'll, you'll, there'll be no more left. You'll never have them again. You will miss those. You want those. But here are your children. And you have only a second. You can't have both. You have to decide which one you're going to grab. It's an obvious choice, right? The woman who wants to marry the 90-year-old uh, guy on death row, it's an obvious choice, right? It's not always obvious in day-to-day -day life when we're trying to struggle between how we are spending our time and our loyalty. We're trying to struggle between what we're going to do on Sunday mornings when our family wants to go do this, but we know the saints are gathering. When we're trying to decide, it's not always that plain and simple in life when we have to make choices between our flesh and blood or, or past uh, uh, religious uh, affiliations or anything like that. And when we're having to choose between that and the people of God. But Peter says, while it's not always that obvious to us in the moment. It should be. It should be that obvious. Pictures of my grandma, my children. You're going to grab your children, right? That's, we, don't, we don't have to say that out loud, do we? Please tell me you're going to grab your children, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it should be that obvious. Choosing the church should be that obvious. Now, verses 24 to 25 tell us why. He says in verse 24, because, why do, you want to why do you love one another fervently with a pure heart? Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And so, you know, what, what is the, the grass that he's describing here? Well, he kind of tells us, he says, it's, it's the glory of man. It's, it's, it's the glory that man has. But Isaiah chapter 40, which is what he's quoting here, he's quoting Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 actually says it in a more kind of plain way. In Isaiah 40, we are actually reaching kind of the center of the book, and it's a transition point. Chapters 1 through 39 are more about Isaiah's time period. He's prophesying and preaching about what's happening in his lifetime or shortly after. In chapter 40, he transitions and he starts talking about the Messiah and the coming kingdom, the church, and, and, and he takes a completely different tone through the rest of the book. And so chapter 40 is the beginning of that. And the New Testament actually quotes from it a lot. And it starts so positively. You know, he says, comfort, yes, comfort your people in verse 1. 
In verse 3, it sounds very familiar. It's a familiar kind of idea. He says, there's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make way the paths of the Lord. And that, that sounds like John the Baptist, right? And that's, that's a, a prophecy about him, that he is preparing the way for the Messiah, for Jesus to come. And uh, Peter is quoting from starting about in verse 6, when, when that voice, John the Baptist, is saying, cry out. And Isaiah says, what shall I cry? And so John says, all flesh is grass. And all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass wither, the flower fades. This is the same thing. It's, it sounds just like First Peter almost. He says, it, it fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely, surely the people are grass. And so he tells us very plainly there, what is the grass? We. We are the grass. People are the grass. There's, we, we are like James chapter 4, you know, a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. Withers away very quickly. Uh, thrown into fire and and gone in an instant. We are the grass. He continues in verse 15. In verse 15, and he says, Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. One little water drop in a bucket. The largest nations on earth. You know, uh, there's there's the Babylonian Empire, the the Roman Empire. Uh, We are, are a great empire, you know, a great nation today. But even we are really just like one little water drop in a bucket. And so it's the grass that fades away quickly. Uh, he, says in verse, um, he says in verse 17, he says, All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. And the idea is not that God doesn't care about the nations. The idea that in comparison to God, a little bitty drop of water in a bucket. And so the people are the grass, the nations are the grass, He says in verse 23, he brings the princes to nothing and makes the judges of the earth useless. And so it's it's the kingdom's rulers are like grass. The people are the grass in 1 Peter chapter 1. And the point of Isaiah 40 is, why pick the grass over God? Why pick something that's going to last for a moment over the one who lasts forever and ever? He says in chapter 40 and verse 25, To whom will you liken me? Why go, Israel, to serve the gods of another nation, to pick the grass of another people? They're not like me. Who can compare to me? Who who created everything? Who is bigger than everything? He says in verse 25, Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. How can a comparison be made to anything or anyone when we are talking about God? And so that's when, that's why if you notice uh, back in verse 21, he's trying to kind of make this point. In Isaiah first, chapter 40 and verse 21, he says, Have you not known? Have, have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he, it is God, not anybody else. It is God who sits above the circle of the earth like someone sitting on a throne, who inha- who's, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. That's us, right? The grass, uh, we're the drop of, bu- of water in a bucket. We're the grasshoppers that, that you know, are minute next to God. He says that, that he stretches out the heavens like a curtain, you know, wakes up in the morning and pulls back the stars to open his curtains, and there's another beautiful day. I mean, God doesn't wake up in the morning, right? You know, he never sleeps. But that's the picture he's drawing. Of pulls it back like a curtain. Our curtains are, you know, this big, right? And you open them up to let the sun shine in. His curtains are the sky, bigger than, than anything. And so he says he pulls it back like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. And he brings the princess to nothing and makes the judges of the earth useless. If you have to pick a rebellion in Jerusalem that's going to be destroyed in just a few years, or the kingdom whose God sits on a throne that is the atmosphere and whose tent, whose temple is the sky, who do you want to pick? These, these are our options. And so that's the point that Peter is making in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. He's making that comparison of Sometimes, sometimes, you have to make a choice. Now, not always. Sometimes you don't have to, but sometimes you have to make a choice between God's people and other people. And he says, 
God's people are connected to God. And so if you're not choosing God's people, you're not choosing God. Who is like me? The Holy One says, who is equal to me? How could you pick anyone else but God? And then by extension, his people. He continues in verse 25, he says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, the grass is the people. What is the word of the Lord? Well, I think in a way, it's a very subtle reference to Jesus. Back in Isaiah chapter 40 and uh, verse 3, he's, that's you know, the voice of the way, uh, the, vo- the voice of the one saying, prepare, uh, prepare the way of the Lord, you know, make way, make, make the path straight. Eh, I'm stumbling over my words, but you know, make the path straight for the, for the Lord, that he is, the Messiah is coming. He is talking about Jesus coming. And so it's a very subtle reference that John the Apostle picked up on in John chapter 1 when he says, in the beginning was the word. You know, this is the word of the Lord. Jesus, the king, will endure forever. And you know, really, isn't this exactly how Jesus lived his life? You think about um, Romans chapter 6 and verse 10. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, for, talking about Jesus, the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, Jesus was born again, just like we are spiritually and will someday be physically. And so he, the life that he lives, he lives to God. It's all about God. He's obsessed with God. That's, that's all that he's concerned with. But I also think about Matthew chapter 12 and verses 48 to 50. You know, remember Matthew chapter 12, when Jesus is in some kind of building or tent and he's talking to his disciples, the people who have chosen him, the people of God. And, and someone comes and whispers in his ear, Sir, uh, your mother and your brothers have come to visit you. And kind of the implication is, you know, let's take a break and go say hi to your mom, right? If your mom comes to see you at the office, you, you, you stop and go say hi to her, right? It's just rude not to, you know? And so that's, that's kind of the idea. But Jesus, now, uh, it's important to recognize that at this point, his brothers didn't be- they, they weren't disciples. They weren't believers. You know, I don't know about Mary. It's, it's hard to believe that Mary didn't, didn't believe in him. But, but whatever it was, she wasn't out there following him around like the disciples were. You know, she was home with his brothers. And so, you know, I, we don't know what to say about Mary, but they generally, that group, is a group of people who he is tied to by blood, but not by spirit, because they aren't one of the disciples. And so he's talking to his disciples, and when someone whispers that in his ear, it says, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 48, he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then he stretched out his hand and said, these are my brothers and my mother. And he said, for, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven, that's my brother, that's my sister, that's my mother. It doesn't mean he didn't care about his flesh and blood mother or brothers. He certainly did. You look at Jesus on the cross. He is taking care of his mother before he dies. He did care about them. He wanted the best for them. He, he, he loved them deeply. But if you have to make a choice, Jesus, even Jesus, would pick the, the spiritual family over the physical family. And so Jesus is, I think, referenced in verse 25. He is the word of the Lord which endures forever. But I also think that, that it is a subtle reference to God's nation, to God's people, because in Isaiah 40, that's what's being contrasted, right? The nations are a drop in the bucket, and he'll go on to talk a lot in Isaiah 40 about the nations and how they're like grass, that they wither away. But, he says, there is a nation that doesn't wither away. And so the word of the Lord, the nation that comes out of the word of the Lord, the nation, the kingdom, the church, that you can read about in the word of the Lord, that you can know because it matches what the word of the Lord says, endures forever. And of course, he's talking about the gospel, and that's why he says at the end of it, now this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. The the gospel, the, the good news, the message of salvation, God's word, which he says was preached to you. It's something you already know. You know Jesus because you have been baptized. You have to to know him in order to get to that point. And so that's what he says in verse 22. You know God's people 
Because you've all been baptized the same way. You've all been baptized into the same body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. And so you know them because you've been baptized, verse 22. And you know his word because you knew to be baptized and because the gospel told you to, verse 22 and verse 25. And so if you have to choose between the word that endures forever, Jesus and his body and his message, or the people of the world, regardless of your connection with them, he says, it's not an easy choice to make. But if we are loving one another fervently with a pure heart, it is an obvious choice to make. Not easy, but obvious. Cling to Jesus and his word and his people. Don't let go. Don't compromise, even in little ways. You know, Sarah tells, uh, tells me often about a, a preacher that she knew growing up and that he would tell this, uh, this analogy or this illustration when he preached sermons like this, that he would describe a person who's water skiing and maybe you've heard something like this and he's holding on to two water skis connected to two different boats. And you know, eventually those boats are going to diverge and you have to make a choice. You can't hold on to both forever. Uh, it'll rip you in half, I guess, if you try. What really happens is you don't get ripped in half. You don't choose which boat you, get, you stick with. If you try to hold on to both, eventually the, the turbulence of the waves and, and whatever else around you will just force you to accidentally let go of one and you didn't pick it. Maybe it was the church, but maybe it wasn't. You can't hold on to both. It's going to diverge. And when it does, you have to choose which one are you really loyal to. Don't wait until that moment of crisis. Choose now what you're going to do. And uh, don't be holding on to two different boats. If there's some way that you're struggling to just be fully committed to God and to his people and to his word, if there's some way that you're not certain, you feel like maybe you, you are, are letting go of God and his people and his word and you need counsel or guidance or prayer, if there is some way you're struggling, Please let us help you to, to overcome that, to be fully loyal to God and to his people, as Peter describes to us, uh, as an obvious choice in this passage. Please come forward as we stand and as we sing.